So where do you read your political news? From the newspapers? Probably not. More likely from the political bloggers, left, right and centre. We interview Mr Craig Murray, once our man in Tashkent, an ambassador, an establishment insider, now a radical blogger, the scourge of his former colleagues. Find out the Craig Murray backstory this week on The Alex Salmon Show, on air and online. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show and to the first of an occasional series on the new kids on the block of political communication. We live in a world where newspaper circulations are a mere fraction of what they once were and where the press that survive are hardly papers of political record. In fact, relatively few people under the age of 30 even buy a newspaper anyway. Meanwhile in the UK, the BBC's flagship current affairs programme Newsnight gets but 1% of the top audience of the Great British Bake Off. And yet, we're at a time of intense political controversy. The Prime Minister believes that the country is fed up with Brexit, but Brexit shows still command interest. Perhaps it's just the politicians that the people are fed up with. There is still a thirst for insight, analysis that is no longer provided by the mainstream media. That vacuum has been filled by the political bloggers. And they come in all shapes and sizes, but command vast audiences. In this series, we look at the faces behind this new media, left, right and centre. What makes them tick? And what brought them into the new world of political blogging? For our first programme, we look at a new entrant in the blogging top 10, as measured by the PR software company, Vuelio, and that is Craig Murray. We find a backstory which is both fascinating and in many ways a testimony of our times. This blogger was once the ultimate insider as Her Majesty's ambassador in Tashkent. Now he is well outside the establishment, delivering scathing critique of the diplomatic world he once bestowed. I decided that we had to go public on the human rights abuses that were occurring, including uh, one instance of, of a gentleman being boiled to death. He was boiled alive, literally. And I'd got pathological proof of that from uh, the University of Glasgow. But first to your tweets, messages and emails in response to the final part in our series on knife crime in London. Faye says, the destruction of communities created by the Tories and allowed to continue by Labour is a result in this and both parties should be held accountable. However, they're only interested in the upper class and the rest of us are expendable. Dougie says, but what about victim compensation? These thugs get community orders and compensation orders. They don't do the community service and they ignore the court's compensation orders. Livy says, exactly, we have to relate. And of course, she's referring to the pastors who said that relating to the, the perpetrators of knife crime is one way of getting out of that terrible rut. But Livy says, exactly, they have to relate. Not someone who can't relate, that will never work. My cousin was knifed because of the color of his skin. We never forget, these kids need someone like this man. Jimac says, the difference between Scotland and England, Scotland has a government intent on investing in its people. England has the Tories and cash back is not a phrase associated with them. Susan says, a brilliant series, an inspired finale. Though the issue rumbles on, there's such hope in these shows. And finally, Cass says, very informative, showing that Scotland is ahead of the game once more. Now, Craig Murray was once the ultimate high flyer, the youngest ambassador in the British Foreign Office, offered honours by Her Majesty the Queen herself. I was um, offered an officership in the Royal Victorian Order, which is a, a medal in the personal gift of the Queen. I was offered a lieutenantship of, or lieutenancy of, of the Royal Victorian Order while I was in Poland, and, and I was promoted and sent and offered to be a commander of the Royal Victorian Order while I was in Ghana. Uh, and on both occasions I refused. From royalty to radicalism. Now Craig Murray is one of the most experienced of political bloggers, writing a commentary which attracts up to 1.2 million readers. How did this transition come about? 
Alex takes up the story with Craig Murray. And now I'm delighted to be joined by Ambassador Extraordinaire and now Blogger Extraordinaire, Mr uh, Craig Murray. Craig, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you very much for having me. Now, yours has been <laughs> quite an extraordinary uh, career. But uh, let's start with, uh, well, let's start at the beginning. I mean, people who know you, Craig Murray, many of the things you write about, your know, advocacy of Scottish independence, you know, have you marked down as a as a pretty, uh, a pretty thrawn Scot, uh, a lad of peers. But actually, you were born in, in Norfolk, were you not? I was indeed. I, I was uh, born down in Norfolk. Um, my father, Sir Edinburgh, um, was posted down there in the Air Force, where he married uh, a local girl and settled down for a while. So I'm, I'm, I'm half Scots and half English, and, and, and born in Norfolk. And got in politics at a pretty early age. I mean, reading uh, uh, accounts of your life, uh, Mr Jeremy Thorpe, then leader of the Liberal Party, the right honourable Jeremy Thorpe, uh, his private secretary received a, a letter in the post, because uh, that's what they did in these days, and uh, just the run-up to the February 1974 election. What was that about? <laughs> that's right. Um, I decided I was a liberal uh, when I was, I think, 14 years old. And we didn't have a candidate in North Norfolk. We didn't have a constituency association. So I wrote to Jeremy Thorpe asking him to send a candidate. And his private secretary, who was Richard Moore, opened the letter and having no constituency himself, uh, hopped on a train and came to fight the election. Uh, and when he arrived and found uh, that a <laughs> a young teenager was was the constituency association. He was. What age were you then? I, I was just fifteen, I think. So, so this, <laughs> Jeremy <laughs> Fox, private secretary from from Westminster or from his <laughs> constituency office, whatever, sets, uh, gets a letter, decides that he will be that candidate. It's a great way to do things. <laughs> <laughs> arrives arrives in Norfolk, but the train station looks for the deputation to greet him on arrival <laughs> and finds this schoolboy who'd written the letter. Hadn't you mentioned in the letter about your your age of innocence? No, no, I hadn't. And in fact, I. I as he arrived at the station, I'd just come off the school bus. So I was in my school uniform with my satchel as well, I, I think. But he, he took it all in, in, in very good part. From that standing start, how did you get on in the, in the election campaign? We did, we did not too badly. I, th I think we actually um, came third. Uh, I, I don't think we managed to overtake the Labour Party, which was the, the aim. But we got, for, for memory, we got something like... 18, 20% of the votes. So well, Mr Moore must have enjoyed the experience because he stood again in October of that year <laughs> in the same <laughs> constituency. By then, did you have a burgeoning constituency association? Uh, we certainly did. We, we attracted lots of members. We revived the constituency association. Uh, thankfully, a lot of the members were older than I was. And it was really my introduction to politics. And actually, uh, Richard Moore taught me uh, you know, a great many of the political principles um, uh, in which I, I still believe. He was a very good liberal man with both a, a large and a small L. And then off to Dundee University. It, was that because you, of your father's connection for you? You were a second generation Scot? Yes, I, I went off to Dundee and I was still active in liberal politics there. And you got active in student politics and uh, uh, if I read correctly, there was a, a change in the rules of the student association by the university to, to stop you standing for a third term. It was like uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt or something, <laughs> that there had to be a, a constitutional amendment to, to stop Craig Murray being a perpetual student. Well, that, that's right. I did two sabbaticals as president of the Students' Union. The university was terrified I was going to do a third. It wasn't just the Constitution and the Students' Union. They had to change the university charter itself and get the Queen to sign off on the change, which uh, w was fascinating. I had, it's worth saying, no intention whatsoever of standing for the third term anyway, because I'd managed to get a job in the Foreign Office. But, they, but just in case, they, they weren't taking any chances. Well, the Foreign Office, <coughs> uh, I went through the Government Economic Service exams, uh, and indeed the Treasury uh, had a reputation for uh, uh, for looking at uh, uh, people not basically dismissing uh, people who might be considered unorthodox, but looking for, for, for brains uh, as opposed to conformity in these days. Do you think that's gone from the, the civil service now? It would be much more difficult now uh, to get in if you have unorthodox political views, let, let, let me put it that way. After I left the Foreign Office, um, a friend of mine, still in a senior position in the office, was invited to a meeting uh, to discuss the Craig Murray case. 
And he went along thinking that it might be discussing you know, how you avoid making false allegations against one of your staff or, or, or some of those things. But in fact, it turned out to be a meeting on how to ensure nobody like Craig Murray ever got yeah. in the foreign office again. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting <laughs> insight. Well, let's get back to your emerge, your top mm. of your year or near the top uh, through mm. the fly through the foreign office uh, mm. uh, examinations. And, uh, and then your initial postings as a, a young civil servant, a young foreign office uh, uh, operative. Uh, were in Poland and then Ghana. So, what were the highlights of your of your uh, sojourn in, in Poland? Um, well, Poland was absolutely fascinating because it was going through the transition from uh, communism uh, to capitalism. In effect, I was there in the early nineties, and it was a time of enormous opportunity. You know, new businesses were burgeoning up. People were enjoying newfound freedoms, but also there was a terrible sadness that a whole generation of people who had been brought up in the uh, communist system lost their way. You know, there were literally hundreds of thousands of people laid off from heavy industry, for example, who would never work again economically. People were in real poverty and starvation almost. Uh, it was a bit like what happened to the UK under, under Thatcherism, but exaggerated, you know, still far, far worse. So it really was very a very interesting time to to be there, but also quite quite complicated, a time both of hope and, and of despair, depending on who you were in society. Now on Her Majesty's service, uh, you had your first uh, direct contact with Her Majesty herself uh, in Poland, and I, I think uh, Prince Charles in, uh, in Ghana, which was your one of your next postings. Why were you cavorting with royalty, a man <laughs> of your views? Yeah. I had to organise state visits uh, for the Queen both to Poland and to Ghana while I was in those countries, purely by coincidence that state visits happened to come to both countries while I was, was there. And organising a state visit, you actually end up getting quite close to, to the Queen and the royal family. And so the visits must have been accorded something of a, a success because you were, uh, you were offered uh, um, some royal acknowledgement. So tell us about that. And in particular, tell me why you didn't accept it. Yeah. No, I was um, offered an officership in the Royal Victorian Order, which is a, a medal and a personal gift of the Queen. I was offered a lieutenantship of, or lieutenancy of, of the Royal Victorian Order while I was in Poland, and, and I was promoted and said it offered to be a commander of the Royal Victorian Order while I was in Ghana, uh, and on both occasions I refused. And were there inquiries from the palace as to why you'd turned down these singular and very personal honours mm. uh, bestowed by Her Majesty the Queen? Uh, yes, the Queen, the Queen asked me directly. Uh, right, person to person? Person to person. I had a one-on-one -on -one interview with her for her to thank me for my work at the, at the end of the tour. And um, she asked me why I'd refused. And I, <laughs> I told her that it was because of my beliefs, that I'm a Republican and also a Scottish nationalist. So I, I, I couldn't accept honours from the British Crown. And what was the Queen, Her Majesty's reaction to that? <laughs> she, she took a few seconds to digest it, looked slightly confused, and then quite literally she said, oh, she said, how nice. <laughs> That's not a bad reaction at all, actually, but your turning down of the honour wasn't a break with royalty because then you, you were in charge of Prince Charles's visit, I think, in Ghana. Which yeah. is, and Ghana's remained a continuing interest of yours. And that too was judged a, a considerable success. What was, the, what was the highlight of your Ghanaian posting? The highlight of my Ghanaian posting was really the general election of 2000, when Jerry Rawlings had been ruling the country for 20 years or more, supposedly in the last eight as an elected president, although it, the country was still effectively pretty much a, a dictatorship in many ways, uh, and bringing that period to an end and being very involved with differed in the organisation of the Ghanaian election. That, that was, for me, the biggest highlight of my time in Ghana. So the Foreign Office, this, this man, Murray, despite turning down royal honours, uh, nonetheless seems to be set for a glittering diplomatic career. Uh, after your success, uh, a judge in Poland and, and Ghana, you're appointed an ambassador in your early 40s. Uh, now, that is, uh, that is uncommon. I mean, to reach the... So you're ambassador to Uzbekistan. You're in the embassy at Tashkent. You're in your early 40s, you've got 20 years or more of Foreign Office uh, activity before you. The expectation as one of the youngest ambassadors in the whole service is you would end up uh, as ambassador in Washington or Paris or reach the very heights of the, the Foreign Office. 
Uh, so you must have thought, as you arrived to take up your post, I'm pretty well set for a, a career of glittering prizes. That's probably true. Um, I mean, I was the youngest ambassador at the time of my appointment. I was anticipating probably my next appointment would be ambassador to Poland. Given that the foreign office had been to a great expense to teach me Russian, I'd probably finish as ambassador to Russia. Something along those lines was my, you know, the clear path that I'd, I'd plotted out for myself. And there was every reason to believe that was going to happen. Welcome back. Alex is interviewing top 10 political blogger Craig Murray. We take up the story where Craig has arrived in Uzbekistan as the youngest ambassador in the whole of the British Foreign Office. However, the idealistic diplomat is about to encounter the world of real politique. You were confronted in Tashkent, in, in Uzbekistan, with uh, activities which uh, increasingly uh, troubled you. So how, how did you, what were these things that were going on and how did you take action? I hadn't been there very long when I discovered that really the dictatorship which was running Uzbekistan um, was a dreadful dictatorship and they were, they were practicing torture of a most horrible kind. And then I discovered that uh, we were you know, engaged in security service cooperation with them and were receiving intelligence material from these torture sessions. So when you say we, you mean the United Kingdom security forces and the Foreign Office? Yeah, I mean, essentially, the, the CIA and MI6 were, were receiving intelligence material from the Uzbeks that came from these torture sessions. But, I mean, this was in the, the aftermath of 9-11. Of the, the Iraq war was uh, on its way. This was a time of international terrorism, of al-Qaeda rampant. I mean, didn't you judge, well, you know, these are exceptional times and perhaps uh, exceptional measures might be justified in that context? I think that... that Three main points to answer that. The first one is I, I think torture is just always immoral and should, should never be resorted to. The second one is that, of course, this kind of behaviour is what makes people hate us and what causes terrorism as opposed to stop it. And the third and very practical one is you don't get the truth from torturing people. Uh, under torture, people will say anything to make the torture stop. And what the torturer wants to hear is not necessarily the truth. Uh, and what the torturers wanted to hear in this case were confessions to membership of Al-Qaeda in order to exaggerate uh, the strength of Al-Qaeda in Central Asia in order to justify all the hundreds of millions of dollars that were being pumped into the regime by the United States. So, uh, you know, the material coming out of it was false material. So your first recourse was to make representations internally. I mean, you're the ambassador. Mm. You must have had access to the top of the Foreign Office, access perhaps to the Foreign Secretary, but then was Jack Straw was, uh, right. was in post. So you must have made these internal representations. So, I mean, what was the response to the, um, our, our man in Tashkent uh, hmm. saying, look, things are not as they seem here. I'm increasingly troubled. I'm looking for direction as to how we can steer things into a more honourable course. I did exactly that. I sent telegrams back to Jack Straw uh, as an ambassador can. Uh, marked top secret, saying we are receiving this intelligence from material from torture. It's unreliable material. We shouldn't be getting it. And it's illegal in terms of a UN convention against torture uh, to receive this material. And I'm concerned about the legal position ministers are putting themselves in by receiving it. I sent a telegram uh, saying that at the end of 2002 and repeated it in January 2003, having received no answer. And I was then called to London, rather than get a written answer, I was called to London to a meeting in the Foreign Office. The first thing I was told was that the Foreign Office was angry with me because such things should never, ever be put in writing. So you got nowhere? I mean, was there any supporters in government? I mean, how about uh, the International Development Secretary at the time would be clear shot? I mean, she would a, a, a woman with well-known... Uh, radical view. Did you think of saying, or were you not allowed to, as the ambassador, contact the International Development Department? I mean, I was told very firmly within the Foreign Office that Jack Straw had taken the view that we should get intelligence from torture in the context of the war on terror, that this was necessary. Um, I had very little support from within the Foreign Office at an official level. I had a, a fair amount of, of personal messages of, of support from other ambassadors, but Nothing. Were there other colleagues in similar positions around the world? There would have been many colleagues in the same position around the, 
world, but nobody else seemed willing to put their career on the line about it in the way that I was willing to do. So then you, you took a very unusual step, but still within the realms of proper foreign office behaviour, you made an open public criticism of the uh, judicial system as, as Pakistan and, and various other aspects that were going on, and you did it as the ambassador, and you cleared your speech through the foreign office. How long did that take to get cleared? <laughs> that was quite hard work to get it cleared. I, I decided that we had to go public on the human rights abuses that were occurring, including uh, one instance of, of a gentleman being boiled to death. He was boiled alive, literally. And I'd got pathological proof of that from uh, the University of Glasgow uh, Institute of Pathology. So I decided we, we needed to go public. And I went through those parts of the Foreign Office which deal with human rights um, and through DFID to clear and, and was it this particular case, as somebody being, as you put it, boiled alive, mm. was that a feature of your speech or was it more generally about torture, about uh, uh, illegal rendition, which was uh, an issue which was yeah. uh, undergoing at that time? The speech didn't discuss rendition. It discussed the torture that was happening and did give the specific example of a chap being uh, boiled to death. But also... And you say you had that confirmed by the University of Glasgow. Was that when you were still ambassador or was that later? In the yep. No, that was while I was still ambassador. I'd received detailed photos of the corpse while I was ambassador. And I'd sent those photos back to the Foreign Office, to the Human Rights Department of the Foreign Office. And they had sent them to the University of Glasgow for analysis. And the analysis had come back saying that the chap had been boiled alive. So to say the least, this speech caused a bit of a stir and brought you into pretty open conflict with your American equivalent. Uh, their man in Tashkent wasn't particularly pleased with the activities of our man in Tashkent. What happened then? Yeah, the, uh, the American ambassador was, was most upset. Uh, and he uh, called me to a, to a meeting where we, we discussed our, our different views. And he took the view that Islam is in itself an attack on human rights, in effect, was what he said to me. And that I had to realize that the Uzbek government was fighting Islam uh, and that we should be giving them our every support and that these minor human rights abuses were not the main thing I should be concentrating upon. I, I wasn't seeing the big picture, was his view. I also got quite a firm attack from, from London coming down from the minister's office saying that they were most concerned I, I'd upset our American allies. I did point out that I had cleared the speech. They were still not impressed. They said they, you know, they, that I knew what I was doing. I knew that I was uh, going against wider policy objectives. And then things took an altogether different turn. You, you found yourself at the receiving end having been the person who was making the uh, allegations, making the statement, uh, at the receiving end of a Foreign Office investigation. That's right. And um, I mean, it came as a huge shock to me. Um, I was on holiday with my family, and I was called back to the Foreign Office to a meeting in the Personnel Department of the Foreign Office. And at that meeting, it was put to me that I was having policy conflicts with the office, and perhaps I'd... I'd rather go and be ambassador somewhere else. And they suggested Denmark. They said that Copenhagen was coming up and, and wouldn't it be better for me if I just quietly went to Copenhagen. And before I could actually answer that, they said, take a couple of days to think about it. But then the chap produced from a drawer of his desk a list of 18 allegations and said, if you don't agree, then we're going to have to investigate these allegations. And I was just absolutely stunned by the, the sheer bluntness of the blackmail, the, the lack of subtlety about it. And these allegations were, were just absolute rubbish. I mean, they were just completely untrue, things I'd never done. I was astonished. I was astonished this could be happening. I, I actually encountered you know, some uh, psychological difficulties in believing this really was happening to me in the real world. So you decided to fight, and you fought successfully. The, the charges were dismissed, but your career was, was over. Your career in the, the, the Foreign Office was over. The, instead of going to the glittering heights of the Moscow Embassy or, or, or elsewhere, that was the, the finish of that. Uh, so what did, how did you pick yourself up? I mean, that's a, a considerable uh, 
thing to happen in your mid-40s and uh, in mid-career, and the circumstances must have hurt you a great deal. It was horrible. Uh, I mean, it was very, very difficult. I went through a period of great poverty. I mean, I, I don't come in any sense from a moneyed background, and I had no other source of income. Um, and on top of which, the, the events precipitated a, a divorce. Everything collapsed on me. I lost my... I lost my job, I lost my family, I lost my income, um, I lost my standing in society. I lost my friends because, as I say, the people doing this to me were my friends. I'd been in the foreign office for over 20 years and uh, an awful lot of people who knew me very well uh, knew that the allegations against me were, weren't true and that was eventually proven, yet still they sort of went along with the official line that I was um, an unreliable and terrible person and needed to be got rid of. So, but the whole psychological experience of it w was very, very difficult to come out of. And for um, a, a year or two, I was very down indeed. Yeah, you had support, I mean, uh, and the cross-party support. Uh, we mentioned Claire Short. Uh, mm. uh, Daniel Hannan, the Conservative Euro MP, these were people who were uh, suspicious of what had happened to you and were advocates in your favour. That's true. Um, uh, Michael Portillo also, quite, quite a few people from the Conservative Party uh, uh, were very supportive. But there were people across political lines who, who did come out in my support. One of the very difficult things was that once I'd been sacked, in effect, um, I felt able to go public on the things I'd been keeping secret, like the extraordinary rendition that was happening. But Jack Straw stood up in Parliament and referring me to me by name, uh, said that it wasn't true and that extraordinary rendition didn't exist and it was a figment of the imagination. And he said that you know you would have to believe that the Americans and the British were colluding and sending people around the world to be tortured. I was in effect being called a liar in Parliament, uh, and that's you know extremely difficult to to cope with. Now, of course, I haven't met anybody for a decade who doesn't believe me and doesn't believe I was the one telling the truth. But at that time, it wasn't that straightforward. And so, as we have heard, the young ambassador has undergone total personal ruin as the high price of political principle. In next week's show, we find out how his fight back came about in a totally unexpected way. The largest number of viewers I've ever had for an individual article uh, was 1.2 million on my own blog. And you must remember that, of course, you can multiply that because popular articles are always reproduced all over the, the internet. Join us next week for the second chapter in the personal story of the top radical blogger, Craig Murray. For now, from me and all of the team here at the Alex Salmon Show, we will see you next week.